Good morning. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Spain, Dr. Preitzman, and Dr. Martin, uh, the AAST appreciates the opportunity to collaborate with SAGES in this effort. Uh, full disclosure, as uh, Dr. Dobrodin, who's in the audience, knows, I started my life as a single port surgeon. It just happened to be a four to six port surgery, or four to six hand port. Um, and I have morphed, which means you can teach an old dog new tricks. So I'm looking forward to hearing what our colleagues from SAGES have to say. Uh, I was tasked with uh, describing the educational mission that the AAST has been on to create the acute care surgery fellowships that currently exist. I'm proud to say that we have 21, um, and I will give you the background as we move forward. So my objectives are to describe the, the history of acute care surgery as defined by the AAST East and the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma, to review the first and then the second iterations of the curriculum and describe our fellows' current experiences, to discuss the creation of the educational modules that we are providing for our residents, describe their experience, and then spend maybe a minute on where I think we're moving in the future. To set the, the, the stage for why the acute care surgery um, fellowships were created by the three organizations that I describe, uh, you are all familiar with the um, emergency care at a breaking point document that was published, which described 11.5% of the population without health insurance um, now in 2014, a 44% increase in the number of patients whose primary care physician is the emergency department in their city or um, town. And this is in the face of a number of emergency rooms closing. Um, so when you talk to teaching institutions, 79% of them were at a breaking point. Uh, and this data is from the middle of the 2000s. And there were a rising percentage of patients receiving their, all their care in the emergency room. In conjunction with this, the AAMC re, uh, released the complexities of physician supply through 2025, and this document demonstrates that there's thir there will need to be a 35% increase in general surgeons. Not the highly specialized surgeons that we've been training, but general surgeons to meet the clinical demand by 2025. Some of this is related to the graying of the surgical workforce, and as somebody who is now turning gray on a regular basis, I can understand that. Um, and again, the increasing subspecialization of our training paradigms. And as of about 2009, 75% of emergency department medical directors felt that they did not have adequate surgical coverage. The other part of this is the health insurance debate, and I'm not going to get into politics other than to say that I hope I wake up in four years. Um, in 2014, as I previously stated, there were 11.5% of the population without health care. This is in conjunction with emergency general surgery as a public health crisis. It affects about 1,300 of 100,000 patients a year, and it is far more common, as you can see from the graphic on the uh, right, than diabetes, newly diagnosed cancer, and other um, health crises that have been described as public health crises. So taking all of this into account, in 2007, only 10 years ago, um, the AAST, the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma, the Western Trauma Association, and the Eastern, Trauma, uh, Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma got together to discuss how to address gaps in, in surgical care and the crisis in access. Um, the, the program was created to train a broad-based surgeon who was trained not only in the treatment of trauma and burns, but in surgical critical care and then with a focus not on routine general surgery, because any, any trained general surgeon can provide routine emergency general surgery care, but the, the spectrum that was focused more on the complex general surgical issues, oftentimes requiring critical care in the perioperative phase. So this is the early um, years of the training program. Again, the conversations really started in 2003. Uh, the ASEP survey was in 2005 the IOM report in six. Um, in 2007, it's really when the first fellowships were approved um, and the curriculum was developed, and then the first fellowship started at the University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas in 2008. 
when the curricular documents were designed, they were only designed to focus on the operative care of the patient, and again, focus predominantly on trauma-based cases. And as you can see from the graphic on the right, they listed essential and desirable cases, but no numbers and no real focus on which ones were more important, which ones weren't. Um, they were divided into anatomic uh, regions, and the program allowed for a significant amount of flexibility as to the amount of exposure the fellow received in the training of hepatobiliary surgery, thoracic surgery, and vascular surgery, all things which are extremely important in the management of the trauma patient, because more often than not, in the middle of the night, we are operating under uh, a fair amount of red stuff and need to know where we're going and how to get there quickly. In 2009, we, we uh, delivered our first fellowship examination and developed a case log system with case entry beginning in 2012. Um, in 2013 and 2014, two documents came out published in the Journal of, of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery assessing the case log exposure that the fellows were receiving. And based on that information in 2014, uh, the operative curriculum was revised to be closer to what the ACGME requires for general surgery residents. Um, we revised the case log, started giving an in-service exam, and then started creating educational uh, modules for the fellows online so that we could pr truly tell that we were um, testing what we were teaching. So looking at the initial case log experience, analysis of the first and second years demonstrated that our fellows were really not getting a whole lot of exposure in head and neck surgery, thoracic surgery, or vascular. And these papers were published by Chris Dente from uh, Emory and uh, Therese Duane then, then from uh, MCV. I believe she's in the fine state of Texas now. So we put together a panel of experts to address how uh, to better communicate to our fellows and our program directors which cases we felt they would be, uh, they needed in order to be a well-trained acute care surgeon. In, and we included general surgical exposures into this to increase the anatomic exposure to, to areas that are not common. We also uh, incorporated simulation, including ACET and ADAM, into our training program and defined the number of exposures and organ-specific management techniques, similar to the way the uh, ACGME does the general surgery programs. And you can see uh, just a snapshot of not only the ex, uh, exposures, but the types of organ systems and what we wanted the fellows to, to learn how to take care of. This is a uh, screenshot of our case log system, which is undergoing V3 revision as we speak. And when you look at the case log data for 2016, and this is a six month exposure, um, our fellows are doing on average about 200 cases in six months uh, with a wide variation as you can see by institution but they are getting exposure in abdominal surgery, head and neck surgery, soft tissue, thoracic, ultrasound, vascular, and um, that's it. In 2015, we started to create educational modules, and the original focus of the educational modules was on thoracic and vascular surgery to hit the, the commonly seen disease processes, both in emergency general surgery and in trauma care. Um, the trends in module utilization are interesting. Uh, obviously, the longer they've been around, the more hits they've received, and these are single hit rates. Um, and then the trauma-related topics right now are more interesting to our fellows than the uh, emergency general surgery topics, although I think that will change. We sent a survey to our fellows to assess whether or not they felt that this was useful. 64% had accessed them at least once and had done up to five topics. 35 had done more than six topics. And again, they viewed the trauma-related topics, particularly the common trauma-related topic, as, as very interesting. So the current state of the fellowship, we have 21 uh, approved fellowships, 108 graduates. Uh, most of that uptick is seen after 2010. 96 percent are practicing in acute care surgery, uh, practicing acute care surgery at urban and suburban locations. Most are doing a, a mix of the three legs of the stool of acute care surgery. Um, and 83 percent are affiliated with either level one or level two trauma centers. The reason that they like their job is that they have a huge scope of practice, a broad case mix, and the case complexity is attractive to them. And 93 percent would encourage others to do a fellowship. Where are we going from here? I think that it depends on the decisions of the American Board of Surgery. There are ongoing discussions about um, 
uh, early specialization. Um, I also think that we need data to determine what our true needs are. So uh, there needs to be an emergency general surgery uh, registry with risk-adjusted data that will capture both operative and non-operative data and ca ca um, capture the patient across a spectrum of care. Uh, the graphic on the right uh, demonstrates higher volume of emergency general surgery with lower mortalities. I am not at all advocating to regionalize uh, emergency general surgery as we have regionalized trauma care, but I do think that there is a small subset of emergency general surgery patients who will benefit from the care provided by people with a significant amount of comfort, if not training, um, in uh, surgical critical care. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn the program back over to Mike, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. We'd be happy to take questions. <laughs>